Um, so for today, we're going to go over that unit three review. And then on Monday will be the homework day. Okay, so make sure that you use that day to catch up on all of this unit's homework and the unit review. Um, and then the test will actually be on Tuesday the 2nd. Okay, so I did go ahead and push the homework deadline until that Monday night, right, at 11.59, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and go into this review. So for all of these four problems, I think I just tried to pick each different scenario, but anything that's talking about the behavior of the graph at the end, you're going to need this information. Is that spelled right? It looks funny to me. Anyway, <laughs> so if you have a positive AX to the even exponent, it's going to look like this on the ends. If you have a negative A but an even exponent, then it's going to both go downward. If you have a positive but an odd exponent, they do this. And then if you have a negative and an odd exponent, they go the other way, right? So we need to know that about all of our end behavior. Let me see if this light will work. I think this is a little bit better. You can see the contrast. Okay, so for number one, number two, number three, and number four, I'm going to write all of those problems down and then we'll talk about them. So number one is this function. Number two is 2x squared minus 4x plus 5. Number three. And number four. Okay, and I think number five starts something different. Okay. So for these four problems, they're all asking you about the end behavior, right? And all we're looking at is one term to decide which end behavior it has. But which term are the one, is the one we're supposed to be looking at? Because here there's two of them. Which one am I supposed to focus on? I'm so, This one? I need to focus on this term, but why do we have to focus on this one? Because this is the term with the higher exponent, right? It has to be in descending order and you got to pick the front guy, okay? So this is in descending order. So I'm looking at this term only. And that term has a negative number in front and an even or an odd exponent. It has an odd exponent. So it actually fits this description, right? So then my in behavior, I think the way that they phrase it on here is like this falling rising stuff, right? So if my end behavior is this, it actually rises to the left. And then over here, it falls to the right. In symbols, it looks like that, right? Now here, is this one in descending order, number two? It's in descending order, so I'm just looking at the front guy. And in this situation, is my A positive or negative? Positive, and is my exponent even or odd? Even. So then it's going to look like that top one. And what does that one do? It rises on both ends, doesn't it? So you're gonna say rises to the left and the right. Okay, now is this one in descending order? No. So we need to put our three, negative three x squared first, then our negative five halves x, and then our positive three constant. And so now we can look at the front guy. And it's a negative number in front, but an even exponent, right? So we have to pick this one over here. 
So then it's gonna go downward. So this one actually falls to the left and to the right. And I hope the next one's the last situation because I wanted examples of all of them. So is this function for number four in descending order? No, right? This guy has the higher exponent. He should be in the front. So we'll rearrange it. The guy with the three exponent, then the term with the two exponent, and then finally the term with the one exponent. And so I'm going to focus on this one. It's a negative number, and then it's x to the odd again. So if this were even or positive, then it would be the last case, right? I haven't had it yet. But that's okay, this one happens to be negative. So it has this same situation going on. So then that is rises to the left and falls to the right. And so you would just select whatever they'll say on that computer. So let me go over here. For something like those on the test, there's really nothing to show Right? It's just a matter of do you see it? Are you looking at the right guy? And are you getting the right in behavior? So for those particular problems on the test, these four, those are really just do you click the right answer? You get all the credit for that problem. If you don't click the right answer, you don't get any credit for that problem. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of are you looking at the right person and then making the right determination. So for this one, it was supposed to rise on the right and fall to the left. And then this one was to rise on both. This one was gonna fall on both. And then this one was gonna rise to the left and then fall to the right. I think I picked the wrong ones up here. Yeah, it's a negative. So it should fall to the right. Is that correct? Rises to the left, yep, and falls to the right. Okay, good. Okay, so now we can look at number five and what does number five want? So it wants us first to find the real zeros. Then it wants us to tell them the multiplicity of the zeros. And then it wants us to tell them the number of turning points and then eventually each tell them which graph it is, okay? So I'm going to pull over to my screen here. I've written down this function. And so if I'm gonna find the zeros, I am going to need to factor this. What does this factor into? Mm -hmm. X plus nine, X minus nine. So if I wanted to determine those zeros, what would it be? What do you get when you set each one of these factors equal to zero? Negative nine and nine. So then what exponents are up here? ones little invisible ones right so what is going on here my zeros i have is a smaller zero is going to be negative nine with the multiplicity of what the negative nine came from this factor and it has an exponent of one so the larger value is going to be positive nine. And what is his multiplicity? Mm -hmm. They just happen to be the same, right? Okay, how many turning points will this thing have? How do we know that? You take the highest exponent, right? Which is two, and then you just take away one, right? So you get one. Um, and then I think the last thing they wanted us to do is graph it. So if I take this and I mark here as negative nine and I mark over here as positive nine, I know I have those two zeros. And I know I'm gonna have just one turning point. What is the end behavior here? Mm -hmm. It's a positive, right? X to the even. So the in behavior is that it would do this, right? So I know that from here, I'm gonna go up and from here, I'm gonna go up. And I only have one turning point. So that means at some point I'm gonna have to curve like this, right? 
I don't know where or how exactly that's going to happen, but I do have an idea of what the graph will look like. Okay. And that's all I pretty much need in order to pick one of these graphs. This is the only graph that looks anything like mine, right? Is this one here. Okay. So let's see, we got um, negative nine comma nine. So for the smaller one, we had multiplicity one. Is the number one odd or even? Odd. And then for the other, the larger x value, we also got multiplicity of one. And one is odd, right? So those should be odd. We only had one turning point and I picked the graph that looked like ours. Okay, let me write this problem down. Number six. Okay, and it's the same directions as the previous problem. So all I did was write odd for the one, right? Because the one is odd. That's all I wrote from the previous paper. So same thing here. Um, oh, this one, I'm gonna have to do some work to find those zeros. Is there a GCF with all three of them? Mm -hmm. So then we just have X squared and four X and just a one. This cannot be factored, right? The only factors of one we have are one times one, and those are not going to give me four, right? One and one will not give us four. So I can set this factor equal to zero and get this as a quote unquote zero, right? But when I set this factor to equal to zero, I'm going to have to use the quadratic formula because we cannot factor it. So I get 16 minus four, which is 12. If I type square root of 12 in my calculator, it tells me two square root of three. So I get two plus or minus the square root of three. So what are my zeros? They're gonna be X, two plus square root of three and two minus square root of three. I don't know why I put parentheses. Now, what is my function gonna look like then? It's gonna have this three X in the front, but this will factor now that I know what I get from that quadratic formula, right? If X equals this, how do I get this to be a zero? I would have to minus this over and then minus or add that over as well, right? So I would get X minus two minus square root of three, and then I would get X minus two plus square root of three, okay? And so a reason why I wanna write the function like this is so that I can see those um, exponents, right? Because here it's a little invisible one, here it's an invisible one, and here it's an invisible one. So this guy's multiplicity is where the zero came from and his, his multiplicity odd or even, it's odd. Then here, this is where the positive two and positive square root of three zero came from. And its multiplicity is what? Odd as well. One is odd. And then here from this factor, you get positive two and negative square root of three is the zero. And that multiplicity is odd as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Looking at the original function, I'm trying to get it all on the same screen. Looking at the original function, how many turning points is this one gonna have? Two, because the highest exponent here is now what? It's three, right? So my turning points are gonna be three minus one, which is that two. And then if I have to draw it, okay? So I'm gonna go down here. What is the end behavior going to look like? I'll go back to the function real quick because I'm trying to fit it all on one screen, but it might not fit everything. Looking at that original problem, we have to look at the term with the highest exponent. What kind of behavior is it going to have? It's positive, right? 
but it's an odd exponent. So it should have this in behavior, okay? So I'm gonna plot my zero x-intercept, I don't know, but two minus three, I don't know what these numbers are. Two minus the square root of three is about 0 0.3. And then this number, I don't know what that is, is about 3.7, okay? So I just wanted to see what those numbers are because I got a graph them. So one is at, let's say one, two, three, four. One of them is about right here. And the other one is one, two, three, about right here. Okay, now I do know what the ends are gonna look like. It's gonna go downward. And then all the way to the right, it's gonna go upward. And I have two turning points. I also know all the multiplicities, don't I? Since they're all odd multiplicities, that means I'm actually gonna go through every single intercept. So I can't just come back down here. I have to go through it, right? And then at some point to get over here, I'm gonna have to turn, right? So there's one turning point and I've gotta go through that. And at some point I'm gonna have to turn again to get through there. Okay, so again, I don't know how exactly it's going to curve. It could go all the way down. I don't know, but we'll see how ours compares to the choices. Okay, so for all of these, um, this one doesn't even have the correct. I got two positive x-intercepts, didn't I? So it looks more like this one. This one has a positive x-intercept over here and the positive x-intercept over there, right? All the other ones, this one has both negative, one negative, one positive, one positive, one negative, or I said that backwards. <laughs> one negative zero over here, and then one positive zero over there. This one's the only one that matches mine. It's like real tiny, you can't even see it. Okay, let's look at number seven. Same thing, a lot of these are gonna be the same. It's just that the functions are changing. So of course those graphs don't look the same like the previous ones. So for this one, the first thing it asked me is those zeros. Does this one have anything in common? X squared. So I'm gonna end up with X squared minus X minus 30. This one I can factor. If you cannot, you can always use the quadratic formula. But I can factor that pretty easily. There's no multiplicity here, so I'm gonna write the little invisible one and make it appear. What zero am I gonna get from here? For x squared, what number, quote unquote, zero am I gonna get? the number zero. And what kind of multiplicity does the, that zero have? It has two, which is even, you're right. Now what zero is gonna come from this factor? Six. Six, and what is his multiplicity, odd or even? It's one, which is odd. And then finally, the last factor, what zero do we get? negative five and also odd multiplicity. How many turning points is this guy gonna have? Mm -hmm. Highest exponent is four, take away one is three turning points. And then what does that end behavior look like? Mm -hmm. It's positive and an even, so they both rise. So let's plot all these numbers. We have zero, we have negative five over here, six over there. And I know this one's gonna go up, that one's gonna go up. And since negative five has an odd multiplicity, I know I have to go through it, right? And zero has an even multiplicity. 
So I am going to have to turn at some point to get back to the zero, right? But if the zero has even multiplicity, so I do not go through the zero. I just touch it and then bounce right back down, okay? Then I do have to somehow get over here to the six. So I might have to turn again, but I'm supposed to have maximum of three. I could just have two, it could just go like this. It would make sense that it does that. I don't know how else, unless it did this, watch. It has like something that does like something like that. It's like a weird little dip. This is considered a turning point. It's weird. It doesn't really create like a valley or a hill. It's just, it changes. It wiggles in there and the wiggling is also a turning. But I don't think that that happens. I don't know, let's see. What do the graphs look like? They gotta match ours. So we have one at negative five. So that one has it at negative five, negative five, nope, and nope. So it can't be these two because they don't have an x-intercept at negative five, right? These two graphs do have x-intercepts at negative five. Then positive six, they also have those. They also both have the correct end behavior, right? Well, how do I know which one is which? I am supposed to cross through this negative five, aren't I? And so it has to be this graph right here, okay? This one went through the negative five, touched the zero, and then went through the six, just like mine did, okay? Now let me, I didn't enter in my stuff here on the previous problem. What did we get for the previous? Oh, we got weird stuff. We got zero and then two plus square root of three and then two minus square root of three. Oops, there we go. So then the smaller one of them is the zero and that one had odd. Then the next one was the two minus square root of three which had odd, they all had odd, so that was easy. <coughs> Maximum is two and I already picked the graph. Okay, for number seven, we got zero, negative five, and six. Okay, between those three, which one's the smallest? Negative five. And the negative five had odd multiplicity. Then the next one would be zero, right? And zero had what kind of multiplicity? Even multiplicity. And then the six had odd multiplicity. And we already picked that graph. Okay. They just keep getting bigger in exponents. Started off with squares and cubes and fourth powers. Now we have a fifth power. You're not going to have this many of them on the test, but I guess the point of all of those being on here is that you're not thrown off no matter what the high power is, right? Whether you see one that's a cube or you see one that's a fourth power, that's not going to throw you off because you've done them all. Okay. So. Do I have a GCF for this function? T, mm -hmm. just one T, because this one only has one. So I get T to the fourth minus six T squared plus nine. Now this is one of those quadratic types. So you can factor it. Just like if this were a square and I would do T times T, I can factor it, I just need to do t squared times t squared, right? To get t to the fourth. And then the factors of nine that will add to give you six should be three and three. And in order for me to multiply to get a positive nine, but combine to get a negative six, they would both have to be negative, right? Which is the same thing as saying t squared minus three squared, right? Now you can factor this, you can. We talked about it in one of the previous sections. We said that you can factor the inside. It is a difference of squares, even if that number is not a perfect square, right? 
normally if you were x squared minus four, you would do x plus two and x minus two, right? This one doesn't have a perfect square, but you can still factor it using the difference of squares. You just take the square root of that. And then fortunately, the square root of three doesn't simplify, okay? Whereas when you were doing this problem and you took the square root of four, you did get a value, right? You knew it was just two and two, right? When you did it before. So you were doing this process. We just never really told you that we were doing this process, okay? But anytime you're gonna break it up, the square root of X squared is just X, right? That's why I don't write square root of X squared and square root of X squared. It's just X. Okay, so I'm gonna give each one of those factors that square then. Why am I doing it this way? Because you want to have all the factors with their individual multiplicities, right? That's the goal when you're rewriting your function is to have all the factors with all their individual multiplicities. Once it is in that form, then you can start um, telling me the zeros and the multiplicity. So for this factor, what zero would I get? Zero. And then what kind of multiplicity does it have? It has one, which is odd. And then what kind of zero would you get from this factor? If I took this factor and set it equal to zero, I would get T equals what? Let's do it. T plus square root of three equal to zero. What would you have to do to solve for T? Just minus this, right, on both sides. So you would get T equal to the negative square root of three. Don't let the square root throw you off. It's just a number, right? It just happens to have a house on top of it. Okay, so just like if it were a t plus three, you would say the zero is negative three, right? It's just negative square root of three. But what is his multiplicity? Even, because it's got a square multiplicity, right? So that means it's going to have even. And then finally, the last one, if it's negative in here, then the zero itself is positive, right? So this would be positive square root of three. And what kind of multiplicity? Also even, yep, because a little two. Oops, cross the L instead of the T. Okay, what about those turning points? How many turning points is this thing gonna have? Mm -hmm. It's the highest exponent, which is 5 minus 1, which is 4. I'm going to erase all this mess that I was scribbling over here on the side. Okay, what about that in behavior? What is that going to look like? Mm -hmm. t positive t to the fifth, right? So it'll do this, got it? And then if I sketch this, what the heck is square root of three? Because apparently I have x-intercepts there, but I don't know what that number is. Um, it's about 1.7. So this is about negative 1.7, and this is about positive 1.7. So that way I can draw them on my graph. I have the zero, uh, one, two, so about here and then one, two, about there. And I know my in behavior. Now, this is the first one, and it's the negative 1.7, right? It has even multiplicity. So what should I do here? Should I be going through it? If it has even multiplicity, should I go through it? I should just be bouncing right off of it, right? So since I'm coming up this way, I've got to go downward that way. Then the next guy is zero. I have to curve to come back up here, right? 
So I'm gonna have to turn at some point. I don't know where that turn's gonna occur, but I know it does turn. Now, do I go through the zero or do I just touch it like I did the other one? This one has odd multiplicity, right? Yes, so you just cross through it. Then the last one is the positive and that one has even multiplicity. So I do have to come back down at some point, right? But this one does not go through it and it shouldn't because I already know the end behavior, right? So obviously it does just curve right there. How many turning points is that? One, two, three, four of them, right? Four turning points. So it's okay. Let's go look at their graph. There's probably looks a lot prettier than mine, but it's okay. So here we got zero square root. Oh, I forgot the negative on one of these guys. Okay, between all three of those, which one's the smaller one? The negative one, right? The negative square root of three? And that one had what kind of multiplicity? Even. Then the next would be zero. That one had what kind of multiplicity? Odd. And then finally, the positive square root of three had what multiplicity? Even as well. We said that had four turning points. And it looks like ours went here, then it went down, then it went up, and then it curved. So ours looks like this one for the most part. That does the opposite of what ours did, right? It has the wrong end behavior, doesn't this one? Even this one has the wrong end behavior. So it'd be down to these two. But this one's not doing the right thing. I was supposed to bounce and bounce on these guys. Okay, so plenty of those types, you will probably just get one of those types, right? So get one with the end behavior, one where it asks you to graph this thing and all the turning point information. Um, you will also probably be asked to do synthetic division just to make sure you can. So I'm gonna write this problem down and then we'll do it on the paper. So that's 66 X squared. Okay. So if this is what I have, I can do the synthetic division. Is this already in descending order? And who's the highest exponent? X cubed, yep. So what's X cubed's coefficient? Then what's X squared's coefficient? And what's X coefficient? 22, and then finally the constant, negative 45, you got it. So then what number do I put out here? If this is the factor, what zero do I put out here or potential zero? Negative nine. And then we start the process. So multiply those, put the result underneath, combine these, multiply those, write in the result, combine these, Combine means add or subtract, depending on their signs, right? If they have the same sign, add them together. If they have different signs, subtract them and keep the sign of the larger number. Multiply those, I get positive 45, so I get zero. The last one is always your remainder. But what does it want my answer in? In the computer, you have multiple choices. It doesn't tell me how it wants my answer. So I am going to assume that it wants me to write it like this, the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor, okay? So this is my quotient and I have to write it, but this is my constant, my x's and my x squareds. So I have seven x squared, positive three x and negative five as my quotient. My remainder is right here, this is zero. My divisor is the function I was dividing by which is actually x plus nine, right? Not just the negative nine. Do I really need to write this if the remainder is zero? No, I can just get away with just writing the polynomial part. Okay. 
nothing. But if that remainder is not zero, you have to write it. So let me write this in here, 7x squared plus 3x minus 5. Yep, that's what I got. Okay, let's try it again, but with another problem. So here's the function that they gave us. Is this one in its descending order? Right, three, two, one, none for the powers. So we can just go for it. We're gonna do three, two, one, and none. And then what number goes out here? What zero? Mm -hmm. So we start our process, bring the first one down as is then the multiplying and combining. Gosh. Three times seven, four. Let me make sure all my signs are right. Yep, they were. We'll find them. <laughs> so this one is your remainder, right? So my quotient is going to be constant. Always start with the constant on the right, then the x's, then the x squared. If you had more people, x cubed, x to the fourth, so on, right? So my answer is going to be 6x squared, positive 25x, and positive 74, plus this 243 over what I was trying to divide by x minus three. And that one does have to stay like that because we did not get zero. So don't freak out because a lot of times you start this process and you're like, wow, these numbers are huge. Sometimes it's just what happens, okay? The only time I would be worried is if it tells you it is a zero and you're not getting zero, right? If they tell you it is and you're not getting that zero, then you know something is not right. Okay, I gotta type this in. So 6x squared plus 25x plus 74 plus 243 over x minus 9, or x minus 3 actually. Okay, so 11 is a little bit different. I'm going to write it on another paper. So I have f of x equal to x cubed minus x squared minus 24x plus 15. And they tell me k equals to 5. And they want me to write it in this form. OK? So I'm going to do exactly what we did before, actually. Um, why is it saying X? I must have hit full screen or something. Okay. So we're going to take this and we're going to do that synthetic division again. This is already in descending order. Nobody's missing. So I'm just going to fill in my coefficients. Now, am I going to use five or negative five out here? Was I given the zero or was I given the factor? I was given this, right? There's no X plus or X minus, right? So if there is X plus or X minus, that's the factor and you use the opposite sign, right? But when it's just the K or just the number all by itself, you just use that number as is. So we'll start that process with multiplying and combining. Okay, so now we're going to use this to rewrite our function. We're going to write it as x plus 5 or minus 5 when I try to stick it in the factor. It'll be minus 5 so that when I solve it, it gets the positive 5, right? And then this quotient, 1x squared plus 4x minus 4 plus my remainder, which is a negative five. 
So instead of plus five, I'm gonna write minus five. And this is what they were looking for. And you can actually check your answer with these. If you distribute this X and then distribute the negative five and then combine your like terms with that negative five, you should get the four terms you, that they gave you at the beginning. So for this problem, you could check it, okay? There's not a whole lot of them. So sometimes when you can check it, it's nice, right? Because <laughs> you'll know if you have a right answer or not. Now, the last part says demonstrate that F of K equals R. Um, so I already know what my remainder is. I know that it's negative five, but if I'm doing this on the test, um, I have to follow those directions. And if the direction said for me to demonstrate that they're the same, then I have to demonstrate that. And the only way we can do that is by plugging in the zero they gave us and seeing if we actually get negative five. Okay, so let's go back to the paper and do part, second part. We're gonna plug in the K value. So we're gonna plug in that five. And we're just proving that it's, it is going to equal the remainder, which was negative five. So I know from these two, I'm gonna get what, 100. And then from those two, I'm gonna get negative 20. And then from these two, I do get negative five, don't I? Right. So you're just verifying that it does come out the same. But if it asks you that direction to verify that it, that it is the remainder and you don't show this, you don't get the credit for showing that part of your work, right? If you just go, oh, I know the remainder is gonna be negative five because I got it up here. That's the remainder, right? So that's what I mean by make sure you follow your directions. I think in the last test, we had a lot of problems like that, where if you didn't follow those directions, you got a lot of points taken off, right? Okay, what do they want this time? They want me to list all the possible rational zeros, and then they want me to find the ones that work. Okay, well, I will do that then. Let me write down the problem. Oops, that's a minus and a minus. I did not write a minus. Okay, so if I have to list all the possibles, we're supposed to take the factors of the constant over the factors of the leading coefficient. So in this case, what's the um, the constant? Negative nine, and what is the leading coefficient? It's just one, it's an invisible one right there, right? So what are the factors of nine? You take nine, the square root of nine is three, right? So I can only go up to three. 1 times 9 is 3. 9 divided by 2 is a decimal, so that's not going to work. And 9 divided by 3 is 3, right? So we get 1, 3, and 9. What about the factors of 1? It's just 1. So I get plus or minus 1, 1 over 1. 3 over 1 is 3. And then 9 over 1 is just 9. So this is what they want in that first box. Then they eventually ask me, well, what are the zeros, right? And so the only way we can find out is if we plug all of these in. Now, since there's not so many, I think I would plug in all of them. However, if there were a bunch, how many do I need to plug in before I can start using quadratic formula? How many do I have to find? And it probably is better to do that strategy anyway. 
just one because I have a cube, right? And a quadratic is a power of two. So I just need to take one of them out and then I'll be able to do the quadratic formula. So let's go program our calculator so we can figure out which of these is gonna be the one to use, okay? So let's see, one stores X and then we're gonna type in X to the power three plus X squared minus nine X minus nine. And so when I hit enter, it's gonna plug in one. I get negative 16. Now I'm gonna save the next value, plug it in, ah, I get zero. So we got lucky, we got it real fast, right? So we don't need to do these, we can just erase them. I've wasted time writing them down. We found one of them. So then that's the number that I'm gonna put outside of my synthetic divisions. All of it is in descending order and everybody's there. So I'm just gonna write my numbers here. And then when I multiply, I get zero times zero, I get negative nine, I get positive nine. And I should have gotten that, right? Because isn't that what I got here? Okay. So if I put this in the quadratic formula, there's my A, my B, and my C right away. So I get, um, well, here I get X equal to negative one. And here I'm gonna get X equal to negative B plus or minus B squared minus four A C all over two A. Well, that's zero and 36. What's the square root of 36? So I get plus or minus six over two, which is actually plus or minus three, isn't it? So I have X equal to three and I have X equal to negative three. So what are my zeros? All those X values, right? So I have negative one, three, and negative three. These are all of the zeros that they were asking me for. I think I might have to draw or something. Let's go see. Maybe not. So possibles would be that plus or minus symbol. Operations maybe, no. I know I've seen it. Or do they just want you to write them all out? I guess so. So we have to do one comma, negative one comma, three, negative three, nine, negative nine. And then the ones that worked were negative one, negative three, and three. So which ones have those answers? So this has negative three, but no negative one. This one's the only one that has all three, right? Negative three, negative one, and positive three, right? This one has positive one instead of negative one. This one only has two zeros and that's it. And this one only has two zeros and that's it. This one's the only one with the correct zeros. Okay. Another problem, very, very similar, but of course it probably has a different result, wholly different function. We don't have too many problems left. Okay, so same thing, we're gonna do our possibles so factors of this 15 over factors of what? A four, the guy with the highest exponent, right? Whatever his coefficient is. So for 15, the square root of 15 is I think three point something. Yeah, it is three point something. So I only need to go to three and then the square root of four is two. So I only need to go to two. 
And once I have completed this chart, I know I have all the factors. So one times 15, two does not go into 15 evenly. And 15 and three makes five. Four divided by one is four, four divided by two is two. So I have one, three, five, and 15, and one, two, four. Oh man, this is gonna have a long list. Okay, so one over one is one. One over two is one half. One over four is one fourth. Now I move on to the three. Three over one is three. Three over two and three over four. Now the five, I get five, five halves five-fourths, and then 15, 15 halves. None of these reduce, so they don't simplify to one of the others, meaning it, so I don't have to write it again. That's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of factors, and I have to type them all in. We're doing one over one, one over two, one over four. 3 over 1, 3 over 2, 3 over 4. 5 over 1, 5 over 2, 5 over 4. 15 over 1, 15 over 2, 15 over 4. So every single numerator has to be over every single denominator. So let me type those in and then we'll go see which one works. How many do I have to find that will work before I can stop plugging in these numbers? I just need one to get a quadratic, right? So I just have to find one that works. But before I go do that, I'm gonna have to, ugh, I have to type all these numbers in here. So this is a long one. <laughs> one, and then one half, negative one half, fourth, negative one half. Oh shoot, I'm not putting my spaces over there. There we go. One fourth, negative one fourth. And then I'm on to the three, right? Three, negative three halves, negative three halves. Oops. Oh God, do I have them all? One, one half, negative one half, one fourth, negative one fourth, three, negative three, three halves, negative. Oh, I'm missing three fourths. See, I'm glad we're back. And five, five halves, five fourths I'm missing, and a 15 fourths. See, missing some stuff there. Okay, now we got them all. Now they match what I had on my paper. I could have sworn there was a plus or minus sign, but I guess not. Because if there were, I wouldn't have to type these twice, right? I just have to hit the plus or minus sign and then one. And it would already know talking about both of them. Okay, so I don't know which ones work. So we're going to continue on our paper to figure out which of these things work. So we're going to start with first plugging in one and then negative one, and we'll see how far we need to go. Maybe we won't need to do too many. So one stores x, four x to the third, minus 12 x squared, minus x plus 15. What do I have in there? Oh, I forgot to put the x. Delete, delete. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I get six, that didn't work. Yay, I got one right away. 
Okay, so negative one worked. So I'm gonna go here, put my negative one and put all of my coefficients. Since nobody's missing, we can just put all the coefficients. Go through our process. Hmm, it said it was supposed to work, right? Yes, thank you. So I get negative 16. So here I get positive 16. And then here I get positive 15. Yay, that works. Good catch. Okay, now we got it, right? So we have our A, our B, and our C. So let's see, um, 16 times 15, 16 squared minus that number, I get 16, which is four. So we get 20 over eight and 14 over eight, which is 10 over four and seven over four. Okay, what is 10 over four? 2.5, 1.75. Just so that I know where they are, right? On the graph, because we have to pick the graph that has these three um, x-intercepts. So we do know the numbers to plug into the box. It's going to be Actually, this reduces even more, right? It reduces to five over two. Which makes sense, 2.5. Oh, I messed up here. What is 16 minus four? It's 12. And why did I know that I messed up? Because I ended up with seven over four. Is seven over four even in this list? It's not right. That's what made me like, why did I get seven over four? How did I get seven over four? So then I went backwards and then I went backwards and I was like, oh, I don't know how to subtract. So, <laughs> so 12 over eight is actually gonna reduce to six over four, which actually reduces to three over two. Is three over two on that list? It is, right? And three over two is actually 1.5. So I probably would have still picked the correct graph, but when I tried to type those in with my answers, I would have gotten it wrong. But being 0.75 and 0.5, I probably still would have picked the correct graph. So the zeros that worked were negative one, um, five halves, and three halves. So let's see. Negative one is the only negative zero I should have. So it's got to be one of these two, because this one has two negatives, and they're not at negative one. Then it has two positive zeros. But both of these look like they have one at 1.5 and then one at 2.5, right? Don't both of those look like they have the same? But which one would it be? What kind of end behavior would this have? A positive x cubed should actually have this end behavior, right? It should be going up on the right and then down on the left. So that's going to tell me which one it is, OK? So none of these problems had asked me about the end behavior, all these graphing problems. They never asked me about the end behavior, but it helped in picking the correct graph, didn't it? Okay, so it's still good to know that information, even if it doesn't ask for it. Okay, now this is a little bit more algebra, a little bit less graph, so maybe able to go a little bit faster on these things. 
number 14. It says find a polynomial function with real coefficients and these given zeros. So you have two and you have two i. But we already know that if we have two i, we automatically also have what? Negative two i. So then my function will actually be x minus one zero, x minus the other zero, and then x minus this last zero, which is actually a plus, isn't it? So that would be plus two i. And we know that if we have to multiply it all out to get those real coefficients, um, always multiply your imaginary stuff together, okay? If there was another factor, I would multiply the real ones together, right, at the same time. But since this is the only real factor, I'm just gonna bring it down for now and multiply these two. So we get x squared, we get plus two ix, we get minus two ix, and we get minus four i squared. So these will cancel and this i squared will actually turn this to a plus, right? So it becomes x squared plus four. So it was a minus, but then the i squared changed it to a plus, okay? And then last, if I still need, co I don't have coefficients because it's not expanded all the way, right? So you have to keep going. So we're gonna distribute this and then just write it in the correct order. And that's the polynomial with all real coefficients. There's no i's in any of those coefficients. It's a plus sign. So I'm gonna type that in, I'll come back to the screen because we're gonna have to work on the next one, it's very similar. So we got x to the third minus two x squared, not that button, plus four x minus eight. So the next one is the same thing, but different numbers, right? So again, we don't know which one we're going to get on the test. So are we gonna get one where they just give us one real and an imaginary, or are you gonna get two reals and an imaginary, right? We don't know what you're gonna get on the test, but at least you have examples of both. So we already know if this imaginary is a zero, then it's conjugate is also. So what's the conjugate gonna look like? One minus i. Only the term with the i changes sign. Right? So let's put our function together. That would be x minus seven, another x minus seven, x minus one minus i, x minus one, but the negative and the negative will actually make this plus i, right? So when I'm the one, it's just minus one. But when I minus a negative i, I get that plus i. So this one, I do have something to multiply. I can multiply the two real ones together and the two imaginary ones together, okay? I had to get real small because I knew there was a bunch of terms in there and I needed to fit them all. So this, let's see, the positive ix and the negative ix will cancel. The negative i and the positive i will cancel. 
but this negative and this minus will actually turn into a plus one, right? Does an I squared become a negative one? And then that negative makes it a plus one. So I have X squared, negative X and negative X is negative two X. And then I have one plus one, which means I have positive two, okay? And I do still have to multiply this out because I do not have it expanded yet. Then from there, we'll combine our like terms. Thirty, so that's seventy-nine. And then the x's. That's negative one twenty-six. And then the ninety-eight. And now it's all expanded with all of those coefficients. That's real tiny in there, sorry. <laughs> so if you were given this problem, like number 15, versus the one like number 14, just be very careful. Don't rush through this problem. Okay, because if you rush out, you're likely to have an error in there. Okay. And it, it's just natural to rush. So <laughs> you have to like fight against it a little bit. Because you just want to hurry up and like multiply it out and get it done already. But you can see how much work is necessary, right? To show everything. So when people start like just boxing answers and that's it, I'm like, uh, no, you had to have done something in order to get that. So make sure you're showing your work. And the most common mistake that's gonna happen here is one, you're gonna forget to get the conjugate or two, you're gonna have an arithmetic error in there. But the arithmetic error in here is not such a bad thing. The other common mistake I'll have is people will forget to change all the signs when they put it as a factor, right? Whenever you put that factor in the parentheses with the X, it has to change signs, always. It's like the opposite of solving, right? Moving it back over to the other side. Okay. Let me have a second. I'm going to type that in there. X to the fourth minus 16 X to the third plus 79 X to the square minus 126 X plus 98. Okay. Oops. Hit fraction. Okay. Now we can get to 16. Some of those last ones are not too long. Okay, so it wants the vertical asymptotes and the horizontal asymptotes. So for vertical asymptotes, do you remember what we're supposed to do? How do you find your vertical asymptotes? Set it, set what equal to zero? The denominator, set your denominator equal to zero. So seven plus five X in this case is my denominator, right? And then we solve, so we'll move over to negative seven and then we'll divide by five. And so we get this as our vertical asymptote. And you do have to type in the whole equation because an asymptote is an imaginary line, right? Lines require equations. Points are just two numbers and that's it. You can't just say it's negative seven fifths and that's good enough. I'm gonna say what is negative seven fifths, okay? 
it has to be x equals. Now for the horizontal asymptotes, so one, if you have to show your work and you do on these, make sure you're telling me where you're getting your x-intercept from, your vertical asymptote from. Make sure you're telling me that you're setting your denominator equal to zero, okay? You don't necessarily need to write that, but you do need to actually show that you're equaling your denominator to zero. And then you can go straight to the answer if you don't need to write this step, right? But just show me where this is coming from, okay? Now for the horizontal asymptotes, make sure you're showing me how you decide that as well, okay? Notice that what's the degree for the top? The highest exponent of x in the top is just one. What is the highest exponent for x at the bottom? It's also a one. And so all you have to say is that your degree of your numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator. If I see that, then I know why you make the conclusion that you make, okay? And I know that if that happens, then that means that the horizontal asymptote is at, you don't need to write this part, but I am going to, okay? But what is the leading coefficient of the numerator? Almost, it's not two. Negative two. Negative two, good. And then what's the leading coefficient of the denominator? It's five. And so then if you just have this, this is fine as long as I know why you have that, right? You're telling me that the, denom the degrees are equal and that's why this is the horizontal asymptote, okay? but you do need to show something. Show me why you're making the conclusions that you're making, okay? Okay, so in here, I'm just gonna type in x equals negative seven fifths, and then y equals negative two fifths. And that's all I need there. We've got a couple more. Again, you're not gonna have that many on the test, right? But if you have all the different scenarios, chances are you'll be able to do the one that's on the actual test. Now, I couldn't simplify that other one. Look at this one and see if you can simplify it. I don't think either the top or the bottom can be factored nicely without me having to do the quadratic formula and without me having to do square roots and things like that, okay? This one is not the difference of squares because the seven is not a perfect square. And then this, there's no factors of five that will add to give me one, right? So I can't reduce it. So there's that. But if I do want to find the vertical asymptotes, I can take that denominator equal to zero. But since I can't factor it, I have to go find the vertical asymptotes using the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus four times a times c over two times a. I do get a negative 19 inside. And because of that negative, it becomes imaginary, doesn't it? As soon as you see this imaginary thing in here, that automatically tells you there's no vertical asymptotes, okay? If I were setting the numerator equal to zero and I got imaginaries, then I would know there's no x-intercepts, right? Because you do the numerator equal to zero for x-intercepts. But as soon as you get i's, those are no good, okay? Horizontals, look at the degree. What's the degree of the numerator? Highest exponent for x is this two right here. What about for the bottom? Highest exponent is also two. So in this case, we got that same thing, right? We got the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator. So we're gonna take, um, the leading coefficient of the top over the leading coefficient of the bottom. So what do we get for the leading coefficient of the top? Mm -hmm. And what do we get for the leading coefficient of the bottom? 
right? It's this invisible one, right? So we really only have one horizontal asymptote and that's it. We don't have any verticals. So we just need to type in y equals negative seven and that's it. X minus eight. Okay, now something interesting happens here and the computer to, or the notes that the book had had told us that we should always try to simplify these things before we start. But I never really told you what happens when you when it if it does actually simplify because we didn't run into any problems that actually simplified. This one will, right? So what will happen is I will take the bottom and factor it. And then what happens is that this factor ends up canceling, doesn't it? And I get one over because something at the top. And I get one over this. Where this factor canceled, if you take x minus eight equal to zero or not equal, because you canceled it, you get that x cannot equal eight, right? This means because it canceled, there is a hole at x equal to eight, not a vertical asymptote, okay? So if you were to have taken this equal to zero at the very beginning to get vertical asymptotes, you would have gotten both, right? Eight and negative eight as a vertical asymptote. But positive eight is not actually an asymptote. It's just a hole because it cancels, okay? So that we hadn't have happened to us while we were graphing it. But I wanted to mention it, okay, in case it something like that happens. For this problem, it's not a vertical asymptote. I would have to take the simplified version to find the vertical asymptotes, okay? In this simplified version, if I take my denominator equal to zero, I'm only taking this factor equal to zero, right? And so I only get x equal to negative eight as my vertical asymptote. Also, when you're doing the horizontal asymptotes, make sure you're looking at the simplified version, okay? What is the degree of the numerator? It's zero. Constants are like they have a little imaginary x to the zero next to them, right? All constants. And between this exponent of one and this guy's hidden zero, one is the higher exponent down here, right? So you got degree of zero up here and degree of one down here. So in that case, my degree of my numerator is actually smaller than the degree of my denominator, right? And so then, because this is one and this is two. No, I'm sorry, wrong numbers, totally wrong numbers. Degree is zero and degree is one. So that means I have one automatically, automatically at y equals zero. There's no coefficients to take when you have this scenario. You only do the coefficients when the, the degrees are the same, right? So I only have y equals zero and x equals negative eight. Okay, now we get into the last two problems of these two problems. They're gonna ask us to do everything and graph these things. So we'll have practice. We did a lot of these last class. So hopefully we haven't forgotten by then, by now. So I have f of x equal to 6x squared plus 1 over x. So I'm going to do all those same steps that we were doing the other day. We were finding the domain. We were doing the intercepts. We were doing the asymptotes, all the whole works, right? And then any extra numbers we need. So we're going to do that same process. So for domain, we have to take the denominator and set it not equal to 0, right? So in this case, that's x cannot equal zero. How do we write that? There's really three ways to write it. There's all real numbers except x equal to zero. There's all real numbers 
such that x cannot equal zero, or there's the interval notation, which is this, right? So depending on what we have in Canvas, that's going to be what you select. So I don't know if Canvas is going to have this wording, this wording, or parentheses, OK? But I need you to know that these two statements are the same. But notice that one has x equal to 0 and one has x not equal to 0, right? So it's super important that you understand the difference and the similarity of those two statements, OK? So this is saying everything but the zero, right? And this is saying all real numbers, just not zero, right? Both of these are saying the same thing. You just have to be very careful with that wording. So if I go over here, all real numbers except, so they're using that word except, which means I don't put the line through this, okay? And I'm mentioning that because if this is one of the options, and then the other option is the exact same wording, but with the slash to the zero, that does not make any sense. You do not select that one, okay? Um, let's go finish. We haven't done any of the other five steps yet. So y-intercept first. That we get by plugging in zero. But I get one over zero, which is undefined. And if I get undefined, then that means I have no y-intercept. Now the next step is the x-intercept or intercepts. Could be one, none, multiples, we don't know. We get that by taking the numerator equal to zero. Can a square equal a negative number? No, I'm gonna get imaginaries, aren't I? So as soon as you know you have i's, that means there's no x intercepts either. So I have no points. I'm definitely going to need a chart. Now let's do vertical asymptotes. We get those by taking the denominator equal to 0. So we have one vertical asymptote. The horizontal asymptotes, what's the degree of the numerator? The degree of the numerator is two, right? Highest exponent up there is two. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the exponent, highest exponent of the denominator? One. One. And so in this case, the numerator is actually bigger, isn't it? Right? Now, when it's bigger, there's no horizontal asymptote. However, if it's bigger by exactly one, then we actually have a slant asymptote instead, right? So in order for us to get the slant asymptote, we do have to do the long division here. So 6x squared, no x's, plus 1, and then my x by himself out here. So why do you do long division instead of a synthetic division? I could do synthetic division only because it's just x. If I do do synthetic division, I will get what? As a 0 as the number that I put outside the synthetic division, what number would I use? Not one, it'd be zero. If I set this thing equal to zero, don't I get zero as the zero, <laughs> right? The quote unquote zero. So yeah, you could do it with synthetic division. You just have to put a zero out here and then six, zero, one. You can, if I do it, I'm gonna get the same answer. Six times zero, zero, zero. 6, 0, and 1. Remember, with the slanted asymptote, you ignore your remainder. You only care about the quotient, right? This is your constant, and this is your x's, right? You have to go in that direction. So always constant x's, x squared, and keep going. So what is my quotient then? It's just y equal to 6x, right? And so yeah, you can do synthetic division. They told us to do long division, but we could do synthetic division. The only time you cannot do synthetic division if it's not just x or x plus or x minus. If there's anything else down here, like a square or two factors or multiple terms, then you have to do it 
the long division. So I think the reason why they stuck with long division is just so that you have like a pattern of what you do all the time. But it, math is really all about style. If they're just telling you you have to divide, <laughs> you divide how you want to divide, right? Or how you can divide. Okay, so let's try to graph this information. So I know that I have a vertical asymptote when x is equal to zero. So that's right on top of the y-axis. I have no points, but I do have this slanted asymptote. So when x is zero, y is zero. When x is one, y is six. So it's gonna be a point way over here and over here. And we can kind of just keep going in that direction. So apparently my numbers go by sixes. Now we need some numbers in a chart. So we need at least two values on this side of the vertical asymptote, and we need at least two x values on this side of the vertical asymptote. So I would pick negative two, negative one, one, and two, and see where, where it is, okay? So we're gonna plug those into the original. Let me see negative two store x. And then I'm going to do 6x squared plus 1 over x. So that's not, there we go, negative 12.5. Now I'm going to plug in negative 1. I get negative 7. I get 7. Pretty sure it's symmetrical, but I'm just going to keep plugging them in, yeah. So I get these numbers. Now remember, this is at one and six, and this is at two and 12, okay? Because if I plug in one, don't I get a y value of six? And when I plug in two, don't I get a y value of 12? This y value is, high, is lower than negative 12, and this y value is higher, okay? So keep that in mind. And then this is actually going to be lower than that. So one, negative two, this is 12, I need to go a little bit further, 12.5. Negative one, this is six. I need to go to negative seven. Now over here on this side, I have one, that's six. I need to go up a little bit. And then two, this is gonna be at 12 or about 12 and I need to be above it. So it's about where it is, right? The gorse mine's not on graph paper, so it's not perfectly lined up, right? But we get the idea we're above the imaginary line over here and below the imaginary line down here. So if I connect these, this has to run this way to get closer to that asymptote. And then it will have to curve at some point because I can't go up. I have to go downward. There's no intercepts and I can't cross through this at any point. Same thing here, this will trail off that way. At some point, I'm gonna have to curve back up and go in that direction. So we have a general idea of what it's supposed to look like. Let's go see how we answer website. So X intercepts, there was none, D and E. Y intercepts, none. And vertical asymptotes, we got no verticals and we got a slant asymptote, which equaled six X. And ours look like this one. And it looked like that one. It had a little curvy on the top and then a curvy at the bottom. Okay, last, last, last one. Same process, just different functions. You're not gonna be asked two, only one, but it's good to be prepared, right? For some reason, both of these have slant asymptotes. That doesn't mean yours will. Yours might have just a regular horizontal. Okay, so we're gonna go through all of those processes again. So first is domain. For that, we're gonna take our denominator not equal to zero.
So I get two values. So again, there's three ways they'll phrase it. I think they chose the accept version. X equals two or negative two. Okay. Then we're gonna have our Y intercept. We get by plugging in zero. So I get zero over negative four, which is just zero. So zero for X, zero for Y. The X intercept or intercepts come from the numerator equal to zero. So X cubed equal to zero. And I get that same point, don't I, for my X intercept. Zero for Y, zero for X. Now your vertical asymptotes, we kind of already solved this, right? It's just now we're gonna have an equals instead of a not equals. And I've already done all those steps, right? It's just a different symbol in the middle, okay? So we have two vertical asymptotes. And what about that horizontal or slant? What is the degree of the numerator? Mm -hmm. Up there it is three, right? And the degree of the denominator is two. So if this one's three and this one's two, the numerator is bigger, isn't it? This little alligator always wants to eat the bigger number, right? The mouth. So then that means I have no horizontal asymptote. Is it bigger by exactly one? It is, so we do have that slant. And notice here it's a square, right? So we can't do the synthetic division when it's a square, okay? So we will have to do that long division. And since all I have in the top is a cube, I'm gonna have to fill in a zero for the square, a zero for the X and a zero for the constant. You have to fill everybody in. So let's see, x cubed divided by x squared is an x and then distribute. So we get x cubed and then we get minus four x. So I'm gonna put that under here and then we subtract. So this one changes and then this one changes. So those go away. I'm gonna bring down the zero x squared and I'm gonna bring down the positive for x, and I'm even gonna bring down that zero. Do I really need to go and do this? I'm just gonna have zero, right? I'm just not gonna consider this factor at all. It's just gonna put a zero here. I am gonna do the next one. Can you reduce four x over x squared? You could reduce it down to this, but don't you still have an x in the bottom? And you can't get a regular factor. So this is when you know to stop, okay? This means stop. So this is my, my whole remainder, but we ignore the remainder when we're finding the slant asymptotes, right? Just ignore it. So you have a slant asymptote at y equals whatever's up here, which is just x. So if I graph this, I have this y-intercept, I have these vertical asymptotes and I have one, two, one, two. And then I have this slant asymptote. Again, I can't draw straight because I'm not using pretty graph paper, but you get the idea. Those are the asymptotes. And I only have one point. <laughs> in the middle, so I definitely need a chart. Okay, so I have to have two numbers over here. So since that's negative two, maybe negative four and negative three, I have to have a number in between here so I know whether it's going up or whether it's going down. I, I don't know. It could be doing something like real close to there or it could be going up, I have no idea. So let's try negative one as well. We'll also do positive one, and then we need two numbers over here. So we'll do three and four. That should give me everything I need. So fraction x to the third, x squared, 
minus four. Negative three. Negative one. Just going through the motions. Okay, so these are the values that we got. So let's go graph those and see what they look like. So negative four and negative 5.3 is gonna be below here. Negative three and negative 5.4 is gonna be even lower than that point. So it looks like it's gonna do this and then go downward because of that vertical asymptote. So on the left-hand side, it's at the bottom going downward. In the middle, we have positive one third and negative one third. So in the middle, it looks like a cubic, a negative cubic. And then over here, we have three and five, and then three and 5.3 is a little bit lower. So one of these should be a little bit higher than the other. There it goes. So this one looks like it's probably doing that as well. And so now you have a piece for all three sections, right? Let's go see what WebAssign wanted. So I have a thing, something to say. If the problem says graph the function, is it enough to just have all the data on the paper and never actually graph the problem? Will you get all the maximum points if you do that? No. If it literally tells you in the directions, graph this, make sure you're drawing that picture on your paper, okay? Don't just put enough information and then pick the, gr the graph that goes, that's the correct graph, okay? Put this information on here and try it. The only reason I'm really big on forcing you to graph this stuff is because when you get to Cal 2, if you cannot graph, it will bite you, okay? So make sure that you're practicing these graphing things. So that way later, it's not even a thing. It's so minuscule that you can just do the calculus stuff and you'll be good, okay? I think we had one, one of these two. Ours looks like one of these two, right? How would I know which one's which? It looks like this line, no, the line is the same, right? Don't they have that same point, five, 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 five? I think we just need to, oh, it's not this one. Because when we plugged in three and negative three and four, when we plugged in three and four, didn't we get five point something and then five point something, right? So we got higher values. We didn't get numbers that were below five, right? That one was really close. You have to pay super special attention. Now I only had a smack asymptote and that was it. No verticals. Okay. Hopefully I got everything right and you don't tell me I got something wrong. There's a moment of clarity. Let's go see. Oh, look, see, something's wrong. Oh, I never answered this part. Oops. It won't let me answer it now. Why is it saying that's wrong? Oh, I did have vertical asymptotes. What were my vertical asymptotes? They're right there, right? I did have vertical asymptotes and I never selected my domain. So now we know why those were counted wrong. Let's go see if there was anything else. This one did not have any vertical asymptotes. I don't think it did. No, that one did not. Hmm, why did you not like my answer? I'm gonna have to go explore that one. Now, yeah, it should have been fine. 
Okay. Um, it's saying it should have been this one. Why should it have been that one? Maybe I didn't pick. Hmm. Oh, we didn't. Oh yeah, it doesn't even have it selected. Hmm. This graph doesn't look like the graph we got. It has the same thing here, but it looks like, see they have it up and we have it down here in this section. And they have it over here and they have it in this section. I don't know how they got that graph. I'm gonna have to look at that one. Cause this was our numbers. And I think we still have the same numbers, negative two, and negative 12.5. Look at this is what we had. But it didn't make sense to me because if this is my equation, maybe that's not the right equation because they're saying no. Maybe it's just programmed bad. I'm gonna have to look at this problem more because it looks correct to me, but they're saying no, it's not right. Uh, more information. Did I forget a comma? I think I forgot a comma. Yeah, I put a period in there. That's why it doesn't like my answer. <laughs> Be careful. If you also type capital letters when they want you to type lowercase letters, they'll count, they'll count it wrong also. Same thing here, I forgot a comma in there. I've gotten lots of text about these statements and it's normally because it's like a comma or a period or something silly dun, dun, dun. where did oh i forgot a comma right here probably somewhere else too i was trying really hard to make that one perfect yep right here too i forgot a comma so one two three commas i forgot in there but other than that, I think we're pretty good. Oh, what did I pick? Oh, I picked two lefts. <laughs> it can't be both on the left, right? That one should have gone um, down on the left, but then up on the right. So it should have been this one up here and that one down there. Silly, silly, silly. Okay, so that's the review. Make sure you try to do it if you haven't already in yours. It does count as a homework grade. So it does get averaged in, right? Okay. If you need to come back to this as reference while you're working on the review, I am going to put the, the video in here. Okay. So it'll be there for you. But other than that, you guys have a good day. Have a good weekend. Make sure you study for this thing and use Monday to just study and do your homework for a couple hours instead of class time. <laughs>